forth fruit. So here's the question. What is it going to take? When I look at the movement of history, invariably it takes either one person to lead millions into untold evil or one person to lead millions in the way of righteousness. It's God's way of working. It's an amazing thing. I remember reading long time back what uh, one writer had said in his book, Filled with the Spirit, Richard Ellsworth Day. Here's what he said. <clears throat> it would be no surprise if a study of secret causes were undertaken to find that every golden era in human history proceeds from the devotion and righteous passion of some single individual. This does not set aside the sovereignty of God. It simply indicates the instrument through which he uniformly works. There are, in one sense, no bona fide mass movements. It may look that way. At the center of the column, there is always one person who knows God and knows where God is going. You look at John chapter 3 and it says, uh, Luke 3 says, In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, Philip being tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis, Lysanias being tetrarch of Abilene, the word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness. The seven who's who's punctuating the historical landscape. And the word of God comes to one person wearing funny clothes, eating funny food, proclaiming a message, and God makes him the one to be introducing the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. It may be distinctly possible. That's why I asked for the young man yesterday who was seated here. I said, how old are you? <clears throat> when you look at a 24-year-old young man, or there are some in front of me, 12 years old, 14 years old, 9 years old, whom I've met and shaken hands with, is that going to be the person God will use to blaze a trail, to change history? I have a letter in my Blackberry that I <clears throat> often read to my colleagues because this came to me last year. And I want to begin with this and set a pattern for what it is I want to say to you tonight that I hope as a closing message will be important for you to hear. <clears throat> this was a young man who wrote to me from Bahrain last year when I spoke, I think it is the month of June. Uh, one of the leaderships there had asked me to come and speak on peace. Is peace possible? I agreed to come and speak with one caveat. I said, can you extend the title? Is peace possible God's way or our way? They agreed to that subtitle and I spoke. A young boy came up to me at the end of that evening and he said, Mr. Zacharias, can I have your email? I said, and why do you want it? He said, I want to write to you about some very deep questions I have. He's just yeah, hi, you know. I said, I'll give it to you if you'll promise me two things. Number one, keep it to yourself. And number two, don't overuse it. I said, I'll be happy to hear from you, but if I get a long question every day, you'll understand I can't always. He said, that's fine. So I gave it to him. Next day comes this email. <clears throat> Dear sir, this is Abraham from Bahrain. We just met last night. I honestly want to tell you that your speech was absolutely awesome. I've been an admirer of your ministry since the first time I heard you speak in Bahrain in 2003. I was only five years old then. Now I am 14. I have finished reading all your books, The Real Face of Atheism, the Lotus and the Cross, Jesus among other gods, Sense and Sensuality, The End of Reason, Why I'm Not an Atheist, The Grand Weaver, Walking from East to West, etc. They made a great impact on my life and my way of thinking. I really wanted to get your email ID and I'd sent an email to your office requesting for it, but I've not received a reply for more than a year. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me your ID yesterday. 
I've also heard many of your tapes, like Barriers to Belief, Absolute Truth in Relative Terms, A Fish Out of Water, The Life That Lost Its Focus, What Happened After God's Funeral, which is my favorite, The Haunting Specter of Guilt, Though the Fig Tree Does Not Bud, The Lostness of Man, etc., etc. I know you may feel all this is pretty hard for a 14-year-old to digest, but I honestly love those messages. I saw the DVD of you speaking at the University of Michigan and the Q&A session. Sir... Thank you so much for the wonderful impact you've made on my life. I'll always remember to pray for you and your ministry. May God bless you abundantly and give you a long life. I remain yours faithfully, Abraham Matthew Bahrain. <clears throat> wow. He doesn't know it. Towards the end of the year, I always go and write. I find a spot in Asia where I take about seven to ten days and write a book that I've promised to a publisher, and I'm planning to do that this year, but I'm not going to go to Asia. I hope the young man's not hearing this in live streaming, but I'm planning to go to Bahrain, in a hideaway place, and just meet up with him and his family and find out who this young boy really is. He's a genius. <laughs> Has God got something big for this young man? I don't know. But I'll tell you this, I am an eternal optimist that all of a sudden God will raise up a voice from somewhere at some time in some place and change the course of history. People often ask me, what is it going to take to make a change? And I say to them, we are just one person away from making a difference in world history. One person away. And with that as a backdrop, I want you now to listen to this because the pathway to becoming that person is a fascinating pathway to watch. I don't know who penned this. Different people give different credit to different authors, but I think it is tracked down to one particular woman that most people agree on who wrote these words. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest heart part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world might be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay that only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with mighty acts induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, or a person, a man or a woman, watch his methods, watch his ways. Around the mid-400s before Christ, there was such a man. He is the cupbearer to the king in the Persian palace. His name is Nehemiah. The character of this man had to be extraordinary because the people had conquered his people. And yet the king trusts this man to be the cupbearer, the taster of the food, before the king himself consumed it. Can you imagine the kind of integrity Nehemiah had to have, where the king has conquered Nehemiah's people, but he's taking Nehemiah to protect him from all threats around him. And so Nehemiah is in this privileged position, just like Joseph was, just like Daniel was. The best of the young minds were taken and moved into the palace of the conquering monarch. And so it says in chapter 1, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem his people, and his city. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, and his prayer occupies the rest of the chapter. 
Chapter 2 begins with this. In the month of Nisan, that's four months after the conversation now. Four months have gone by. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should not my face look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, How long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. His beloved city and his beloved people. I want you tonight to focus on your own nation. I don't know much about it. I'm a stranger and I'm a visitor. But I do know about the land where I now live. And the land where I was born. And those are ever in my sight when I watch trends and when I watch things happening. And so if you will apply it to your own nation, and I ask you to ask yourself the question, how dear are your cities to you? How passionately do you long to see something happen in the land that you love, in the land that you so care for? Because that is critical when you start out in a mission there is no division between the sacred calling and the secular calling. I don't know why we ever made that difference. If you are an engineer who is a Christian, if you're in political work, if you're an artist, if you're digging ditches somewhere, if you're farming, if you're a professor, you are not in secular work if you're a follower, a follower of Jesus Christ, you are either in sacred work or profane work. The opposite of sacred is not secular. The opposite of sacred is profane. There is no such thing as the seculum literally means this worldliness. You don't live for this world alone if you are uh, truly a follower of Christ. You help to change this world. You help to make this world a better place. And so if you have a passionate commitment for your country, I truly believe things can happen. And here's the way it began with Nehemiah. He felt the pressure within his own soul. You will never lighten, lighten any load until you feel the pressure in your own soul. You will never lighten any load until you feel the pressure in your own soul. Some years ago in New York City, a terrible event had taken place. I won't even give you the details of that story, but it was a horrific thing that happened in a woman's life to her little baby. It hit the fan. It came on the headlines. New York City that is so large and gets accustomed to some horrific news now and then was in stunned silence over this incident. And nobody knew what to even say. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was uh, a senator at that time, may raise the question, how could so much go wrong in one life and nobody be alert to it? And he went through a litany of issues that had taken place in her life and he said, how come so much went wrong and nobody was alerted to it? Nobody was answering. Then a city councilman answered this way. He said, Mr. Moynihan, I want to answer you. He said, you know, sir, I'm a city councilman in a borough. I don't even have a heart big enough sometimes to bear all of the heartaches and the struggles my family faces. You're asking me why I'm not bearing the struggle of my whole community and my whole borough? Sir, if you want me to listen to the heartbeat of every person here and the heartache of every person, this is what he said, you may as well ask me to listen to the sound of the heartbeat of every squirrel and the sound of every blade of grass growing, the noise would be deafening on the other side of silence. That's what he says. 
You may as well ask me to listen to the sound of every blade of grass growing and the heartbeat of every squirrel. The noise would be deafening on the other side of silence. And when I read that, I began to think about it. It's true. You cannot bear the heartache of a whole world. Not even your whole community. There's only one place in the world where there's an aggregate of human suffering. That's in the heart of God. What God does is take those heartaches and those struggles, break them down into bearable size portions, put some into your heart, some into your heart, some into mine, and makes that bearable burden with individualized capacities. I hear of so many needs, and sometimes I have to say, I really can't meet it. But I also have to answer before God, what is the need that I have chosen to meet? What is the heartache that he has given to me that I am to carry before this world? I'm a Christian apologist with a small organization that is in 10 different countries and about 30, 35 apologists in our ranks and 100 odd, odd people serving here in different capacities. And you know what? Sometimes I find that burden too heavy to bear. It's rather large and rather vast, and yet that's what God has called me to do, to take the gospel message undergirded by apologetics into hostile arenas and adversarial settings. We are not masochists. We don't like to get into tough situations, but that's what God has called us to do, and that's the burden that he's put on my heart. We go into four arenas, Political, academic, business, and the arts. That's our calling. Because these four arenas, I believe, shape a culture. That's my calling. To take the gospel into these hostile arenas. Challenge the happy pagan. So that they will see their lostness apart from God. What is the burden you're willing to carry for God? What is the burden you're willing to carry? Are you willing to tonight say to him, in my nation or in my land or in my calling, I want you to pour out your burden on my heart. Some of you may be blessed financially. God is asking you to learn to give generously, to give to the causes that are needy. Some of you may be blessed in extraordinary teaching capacities. Get involved in your church. Teach, multiply, mentor young people. Some of you may have the gift of connecting with the ordinary person on the street. Don't let those moments go by. Carry a burden that God has given to you. You know, I find it fascinating, and I remind myself of this, and I'm not being critical. Francis Schaeffer was one of the greatest philosophers of the latter part of the last century. And for whatever reason, his son Frankie Schaefer, walking closely with God once upon a time, then renounced that belief and went into a weird extremist type of belief system. His mother, Edith Schaefer, passed away just two or three months ago, I believe it was. He wrote a tribute to his mom that is absolutely spellbinding. And it was published of all places in a liberal newspaper called the Huffington Post. And you know what he said? He said, my mother loved me through all of my behavior and all of my arrogant self and all of the various area. He said, one of the books I wrote was so profane. And my mother never wrote a word against it to me. She just loved me through all of those times. And he described how he, she nurtured him in that love, even in his derelict years. Fascinating. The father was the apologist. This tribute is to his mother. And at the end of that tribute in Huffington Post, eulogizing his mother, he said, Mother, you have won. I believe. You have won. Actually, I think you used the word triumph. You've, you have triumphed, and I believe. And as I read that, I thought to myself, all of the arguments, all of the apologetic, never penetrated into his heart. 
It was the love of a mother and the faithful, devoted heart that she had for him over the years ultimately pierced that encrustation and touched the tender spot of his heart. Don't underestimate what you can do. Never underestimate. Some of you may say, I'm not cerebrally driven. I don't have all the ability. That's fine. This world would be pretty boring if all we did was sit around a pizza and talk philosophy. <laughs> Ask God what it is he wants you to do to help change the nation. You will never lighten any load until you feel the pressure in your own soul. He felt a pathos for his people. Secondly, he began his entire mission as a man of prayer. The moment the king asks him, what is it you want to do? He said, so I prayed to the God of heaven. You know, when I see how many times this happens, within a handful of times here, within a handful of chapters here, repeatedly it comes, and so I prayed to the God of heaven, so I prayed to the God of heaven, so I prayed to the God of heaven. This man was a civil engineer whose brother comes to him and tell him, tells him the walls are broken, the city is in ruins. He talks to God in prayer. Four months later, the king asks him, what's bothering you? He said, my, the city of my father's lies in ruins, the gates are burned, my people are in distress. The king says, what do you want me to do? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So I prayed to the God of heaven. You will ultimately win every major battle on your knees. You will win every major battle on your knees. You know, when I grew up uh, as a young boy in Delhi, my parents used to take me to an Anglican church. I memorized most of the prayer book. The reason I memorized it was because I wanted to time when the service would be over. <laughs> I knew as soon as the vicar said, and so by faith let us draw near together, we were about seven to ten minutes away from finishing this whole thing. And I would be on the cricket field immediately after that. And the years went by. And uh, I recall, you know, when I was uh, once asked to play the part of Joseph in the Nativity Mime, I didn't know what, a new, know what a Nativity Mime was, and I didn't even know what Joseph had to do. Till they told me, you don't have to do anything. You just stand in the wings, put your arm out. Mary will put her arm in yours. You walk up to the middle. You stand there and keep looking to the side. I'll, say, I'll signal to you. Put your arm out. Mary will put her arm in yours, and you walk out. That's all you have to do. I was going to say no until they introduced me to Mary. I said, this is great, you know, I'll get somebody to put their arm in. That's, that was church for me. That's what it's all about. In fact, I went one day into the altar and I saw some wafers there in a silver cup. I thought this was a charitable thing. I took those wafers and started to eat them. And the vicar walked into me and saw me and he just thought, what on earth? He used words, by God's grace, I did not understand. <laughs> and I got crumbs all over me, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I saw some biscuits there, would you like some? And I offered it out to him. <laughs> that, was, that was my church for me. I think it was about 30 years later, I was in Delhi at the American Express Travel Agency, and Father Ernest T. John, that was a man, walked in. And he looked at me, and he says, do I know you? I said, my name is Ravi Zacharias. He knew my father very well. My father sang in the choir. He was the soloist. He said, you're Ravi Zacharias? And my wife was standing right next to me, and she knew this was the boy who I had the wafer experience with. And she's standing there. Do you know what he said to me at one question? What do you do for a living? <laughs> he thought I was some thug somewhere stealing cookies and distributing it to people or something like that. That was church for me. You know, after I came to know Christ, on my 50th birthday, Margie, my, my wife is just a remarkable woman in terms of finding things. She's a sleuth that way. And she said, what do you want for your 50th birthday? I said, I really don't want anything. I've, I've, I've just got everything I need. I promise you I don't want anything. Let's just go out and have a wonderful dinner with the family. She said, no, I want to get you something special. I said, you know what, honey? You know what I'd love? If you can find one anywhere without spending too much, find me an old Anglican prayer bench. 
she found it. And she delivered it on my birthday and it sits in my study. And my day begins on my knees on that old Anglican prayer bench. It's a beautiful thing to kneel there and ask yourself the question, how many thousands have knelt here before? If this prayer bench could talk, what are the words it has heard of penitence, of supplication, of repentance, of hope, of promise? I keep a Bible and a hymn book on that and I read the words of a hymn and read the word and I begin my day on my, knee, on my knees. Prayer will do three things for you. Number one, it will enable you to see your heart as God sees it. At least you'll get close. Because when you're on your knees, it's not a showcase for your talents. It is a true point of recognizing as the moment you begin by saying, Heavenly Father, Holy Father, Almighty God, those first two words remind you, you are not sovereign over this universe. It immediately brings you into your finitude, your limitation that you cannot solve all of the world's problems, but you know who can. And if you begin your life each day in prayer, it will enable you to see your heart as God sees it and as God wants you to understand what it is you really are like. So the first thing it does, it recognizes God's sovereignty. The second thing it does, it enables you to see your heart as God sees it. And thirdly, something enormous happens in that transaction. Absolutely enormous. It is when the grand weaver begins to pull the threads together in your life. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer, talks about the fact that people often taunted and said things like, when you pray, you only think you're talking to someone. It is nothing more than auto-suggestion. It is nothing more than imagining that you're speaking to somebody, that you're actually dreaming you're talking to someone. There's nobody out there. And he writes this, they tell me, Lord, that when I pray, only one voice is heard, that I am dreaming, you are not there, this whole thing is absurd, that only one voice is heard, you're not there, I'm dreaming, that only one voice is heard. Maybe they're right, Lord, maybe they're right, if there is only one voice, it is not mine, it is yours, I am not dreaming, you are the dreamer, and I am your dream. You are the dreamer, and I am your dream. When you are before God in prayer, He is making you the dream of what He intends you to be. That's when He pulls the threads together in your life, like the grand weaver, in silence, in humility, in petition, in calling upon God. The day you believe that your prayer life is the most critical aspect of who you are spiritually, your life will be dramatically changed. Please hear me. The day you believe that your prayer life is the most critical part of your spiritual life, your life will be dramatically changed. I've known prayer warriors like that. I have been with people like that. I have watched their lives and I have seen how much of an impact they have really made. You know, one of the great missionaries was Jonathan Goforth of China. His uh, granddaughter, I believe it was, who one day stopped me in my tracks in Toronto and asked me if I would be willing to go to, Ch to Vietnam to speak, and she raised all of the funds for it. And in her senior years, she was a missionary to Vietnam for 50 years, and I went to Vietnam, preached, changed my life. It triggered the revival in Vietnam in 1971. My interpreter was 17 years old, I, I was 25, 
cumulative age of 42, and, the, and Vietnam has had the revival ushered in over the preaching of these and the interpreting of these two young lives. When I was speaking away from Toronto late one Sunday night, I came back and my wife Margie said to me, Ravi, I think you should go straight to the hospital. Mr. Jeffrey is dying. I said, oh no. And I walked into the hospital. I remember it was pouring rain. My windshield wipers could barely keep up with it and arrived at the hospital and finally walked into the room as her husband was standing there. She was half in and out of it. And when I just leaned over and said, Mrs. Jeffrey, she turned her head, she said, Ravi, is that you? I said, yes. She said, will you please make sure that Pilgrim's Progress is translated into Vietnamese someday? Will you make sure that the Bibles continue to go into Vietnam? And here she was, minutes away from death. My wife remembers, I got into my car and as I was driving back, I said to her, I have just been in the presence of somebody in whom the Spirit of God dwelt. She won many of her battles as a woman of prayer. You may win it, you will be a different person and become the dream of God. You'll know God's sovereignty, you will know your heart, you will become the dream of God. Here's what I want to say to you. Robert Browning, I think, said it. When I see children ride a cork horse, I find it in my heart to embarrass them and tell them their sticks are more coarse and they really are carrying what they say carries them. When I see children ride a cork horse, I find it in my heart to embarrass them and tell them their sticks are more coarse. They really are carrying what they say carries them. If you're a praying Christian, your faith in God will carry you. If you're not a praying Christian, you will have to carry your faith and you will get exhausted bearing the infinite. If you're a praying Christian, your faith in God will carry you. If you're not a praying Christian, you will have to carry your faith and you'll get exhausted bearing the infinite. Felt a pathos for his people, prioritized his mission by prayer. Thirdly and importantly, he pondered in proximity. He pondered in proximity. He went close. You will never win the world until you get close to the arena of need. You will never win the world until you get close to the arena of need. You must enter the terrain that you are asking God to help change. You know, my second daughter, Naomi, she's just a tiny little one. In Tamil, you call the hottest peppers Kanderi Molaga tiny little pepper. My mother used to say the smallest peppers are the hottest peppers. And that's my second daughter, Naomi. She has a mission to reach women in the sex trafficking industry and rescue those who are victim to AIDS, women and children at risk. She runs the social arm of our ministry called uh, Wellspring International. She was working in the White House when I called her one day and asked her if she would undertake this arm of our ministry and she resigned her job there and came and took this on in order to be the director of Wellspring International. When she goes to Amsterdam, I don't know if any one of you have seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire. When you see that street in Mumbai in the movie Slumdog Millionaire, I have been there. I've walked through the streets. That's where Naomi got her burden and her passion to rescue women from this sex trafficking horrific trade. She goes to those streets, she finds projects, she raises the money, she gets it done. All that is raised, 100% goes into these projects. She goes into Amsterdam with one other person that was running this ministry. She'll have a Bible in her purse and she'll walk into the brothels one at a time. This tiny little kid. My heart beats with fear sometimes. When the tsunami came in uh, Indonesia, Banda Aceh and so on, she and my older daughter just packed her bags and they went. There, were some, there was some period, one period of time where I hadn't heard from them for nearly 48 and 72 hours and I was terrified where they were they were supposed to be on a plane heading home. I still remember speaking at Penn State University and I kept my phone on a vibrate to 
pray to the Lord, please let at least one of them get in touch with me, that they're okay. And in the middle of my talk, it did vibrate. I very covertly looked at it. It was from them. I knew they were okay and continued in my talk. She goes into those places. I one day said to Margie, I haven't heard from Naomi for two or three days. She, they said, where is she? She said, oh, well, she's on a certain project. She said, where? She said, I don't know exactly. My wife was very smart when she answered that. She didn't want to tell me my daughter was in Pakistan. Very wearing a chador. Walking into places, rescuing people. And one day I sat her down. I said, Nims, I got to talk to you, honey. I said, I want to talk to you. Why do you take such risks? You know what she says? She says, Dad, when we were young, I asked you that one day. Why do you take such risks? And you told me that we had to learn to trust God. It's your turn now. <laughs> she has become an apologist. She knows how to answer her father. <laughs> you know, you're never going to accomplish anything much unless you get close. Unless you get close to the situation. Yes, it's a risk. Yes, it's danger. But I dare you to believe if God is calling you to a certain place, commit yourself to him, trust him, and get close to where the predicament is that you really want to change. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. You know, I'm 67 years of age now. And I look at the younger guys and gals. We've got a wonderful team of apologists. And every now and then I'll tell them, you know what? I'm not ready to ride out into the sunset, but I do know which side my horse is facing. There you go again, macho outdoor analogy. I've never ridden a horse for more than two minutes, you know, but it sounds good. <laughs> and one of the younger apologists last week was with me in uh, wherever we were in Singapore. He calls me uncle. He says, uncle, I want to ask you a question. You're not thinking of quitting right now, are you? I said, no. But the day might come where the Lord determines it's time for me to move on and you guys are going to have to carry the torch. It's been a beautiful, marvelous life. I will never trade it for anything else. But there are times I've stood in front of an audience where I've desperately wished it was somebody else doing it and not me. God will use you. God will use you as a young person. God will use you as an adult. You must get close. That's where burdens are lifted. That's where burdens are given. Nehemiah gets close, and then he moves to the next step. He knows what he's going to prepare with. What is it he's going to need? What is the cost of this? He needs the timber. He needs the plan. He gets alone on his donkey into the shattered, broken walls, and he rides there alone at night, takes all of his friends and tells them, you can't come any closer than this. I'm going alone in there. He gets the material. He starts the preparation and assigns to every home the responsibility of building the wall in front of their domicile. In front of their home, they were to build the wall. Fathers, mothers, you begin building the wall at home. You prepare your children and do your part in helping them go in to the arena. You know, we have a strange time. We have a woman on our staff, her name is Ruth, recently joined us. She went to a very prestigious university, very difficult to get into that university, but she went in and every day she's sitting, this is in the United States, and she's sitting and listening to the professor who's mocking her, mocking Christianity. They're, they're cowards, you know, they're really cowards. They don't do it with Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism because they know the penalty they will pay, but they can sure mock the Christian faith. And so this professor is mocking it on and on and on. And one day she puts her hand up. She says, excuse me, I don't appreciate this. You are mocking something that is sacred to me. He said, if you don't like it, you go and see the dean. I'll set an appointment for you. So he sets up an appointment and sends it to the dean. This gal is a new on our staff. She sat down the first day she met me and told me this story. I've known her father, who's a professor. 
And so she's telling me this story and she says, I go into the dean's office and the dean says to me, I said to the dean, why am I here? He said, I hear you're being very disruptive in the classroom. And she says, I'm being disruptive? He says, yeah. He says, you're interrupting the professor. She says, no, sir. He keeps mocking things that are sacred to me. And she said, I just cannot stand it anymore. He said, you don't understand. You're here for an education. She said, this is not an education. This is indoctrination. Listen to what he says to her. Oh, no. You've got this all wrong. For 18 years in your home, you were indoctrinated. We are now here to educate you and change all the wrong beliefs. Whoa. Statecraft has become soulcraft. They are crafting your soul. Prepare your children. Help them to understand what it is they are going to see. And for yourself, study. Learn, read. Let us not get idiotized night after night in front of a box. Let us take the books. Let us take the books. I have absolutely no doubt if Paul were living in our, in our day, he wouldn't have said to Timothy, when you come, bring a television set with you. He says, bring me my cloak, bring me the books, and bring me the parchments. You must study. You must challenge your mind. Read, 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 because reading will give you the sovereignty of your imagination. A picture circumscribes it for you. If there's a place for it, but there's a place for propositional truth. In the beginning was not video. In the beginning was the word. And you must learn to understand that. And so he prepares... And finally, he comes to a point of, a, of avoiding the paralysis of pessimism. Please don't be pessimistic about things. The tyranny of the immediate will destroy many, many of us if we only look at the immediate. There are people who have come to know Christ along the journey which we have taken where I never ever dreamed that they would commit their lives to Jesus Christ. You know, there's a man who wrote to me from a prison in Michigan. And he said, he wrote to the office. He didn't even know how to get, so he just wrote to the office. He said, will somebody hand this letter, please, to Ravi? And he said, I'm in prison for murder. I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. He said, my life was hopeless, forsaken, gone. I started listening to a radio program and listening to this man and all along I thought he was Scottish because of his accent my apologies to the Scots he said and then I was sure he was Scottish because I heard his name as Robbie Zacharias R-O-B-B-I-E 90% of my mail from the radio has it as R-O-B-B-I-E Robbie Zacharias I don't know what it is but they think it's Robbie he said then I laid my hands on a book I was shocked to find out his name is not Robbie it's Ravi he said, here's the point. He said, I'm in prison. And through Ravi's ministry, I have come to know Christ. But I want you to tell him this. I am in prison for murdering an Indian man. A convenience store owner. <clears throat> he said, what but the grace of God could have found me in prison and led me to himself through the preaching of an Indian man. Think about it. One of my people, he murdered. God calls one amongst us to speak to his heart and proclaim forgiveness and salvation. I have hope. You know why I have hope? I have hope because our young people in our churches are some of the brightest minds ever. I had a young African-American boy who showed up at my office at age 12. Dark suit, bow tie. His father said, what do you want for your 12th birthday? 
Yes, I want to go and meet this man that you listen to on the radio every Sunday while you're taking us to church. And so young Benjamin, age 12, smart, sharp as a tack, sitting there, his dark suit with a bow tie. Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Very grateful to you, sir. Just recently, after years, I bumped into his father in a restaurant. He said, you may not remember me, but my son Benjamin, when he was 12, came and asked to meet you. I said, I remember that very well. My wife was with me. He said, are you having dinner here? I said, yeah. He said, uh, well, let me buy it for you. I said, no, 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 there's five others, there's seven of us. I said, please don't, there's plenty. When we went out after dinner, he'd paid the check for all seven of us just for the thankful heart to meet his little boy. I have hope in the youth of today. And I see some of you scattered around here. I say to you, be a world changer. Don't get pessimistic. Don't lose heart. Nehemiah built that wall and came back and brought peace for his people. Isn't that what you want for your land? That what we want for ours? You start off with a passion, you go through the priority, you move through proximity, you remember to not to be prepared, you don't get pessimistic, and finally you bring peace for your people. I want to close with this illustration, and the time is gone, and I have presumed upon your patience for the night after night. Actually, I wrote to Mario when he booked me, I said, you're having me speak too much, they're gonna get tired of this voice. I think some of you are probably gonna get up in the middle of the night and say, hit me, I can still hear him. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> People, when they listen to my voice, ask me if I've got a cold, I said, no, this is my normal voice. It's the way it is, it's when I'm sitting on a plane sometime and a flight attendant comes and just says, what would you like? And I say, a Coke, thank you. She'll often take two steps and come back and say, I've heard that voice somewhere before. It must be a weird voice, you know, they hear it. In 1971, when I was 25, Mr. Jeffries, uh, I'm not 100% sure whether she was granddaughter or daughter of God, Jonathan Goforth. If my wife were here, she'd tell me. But she was a direct descendant of Jonathan Goforth. Asked me to go and speak in Vietnam. For four months, I did. 3,000 came to know Christ. As I said, if you read a history of the church in Vietnam, you'll say in 1971, a revival broke out. It came from the preaching of a young person with a young interpreter. My interpreter was 17. His name was Pham Hien. Actually, Hien Pham. So we called him Hien. We traveled by helicopter gunships and transport planes and sometimes by motorbike, long journeys, took our life in our hands off. And I was single, I really didn't worry about those things. We went through and had a lot of response. On the last day, we were in Nha Trang, I think, and then on to Saigon. I held this guy by his shoulders, wee little guy, tiny little guy, powerful interpreter. Once in one of the sermons, he stopped me and said, I think the Spirit of God is already moving. Let's not ruin this and let's not keep continuing. Let's give them the invitation right now. I was 17. So I took him, gave him a hug. I said, Hien, I don't know if I'll ever see you again, but I just want you to know this has been a life-changing experience for me. He said, my same for me, Brother Rafi. He always called me Brother Rafi. 1971. 1988, I'm in a hotel room in Vancouver, British Columbia at 11 o'clock at night. My phone rings in my hotel room. At that hour, I thought, must be my family. When I picked it up, I said, hello? This voice says, Brother Rafi? <laughs> I said, him? He said, how did you know? I said, you're the only one who calls me Brother Rafi, you know? <laughs> he said, you recognize? I said, Hien, where are you? He said, I'm in California. I said, what are you doing in California? He said, have you got time? I said, I've got all the time. We're in the same time zone, British, Vancouver, British Columbia, California, same time zone. I said, go on. He said, after you left and the Viet Cong took over, 
I was one of the first few they arrested because they knew I worked with the American troops as an interpreter. They know everything about what I did with you and so on and so forth. They put me into a prison and said I was a CIA operative. I said, I'm not a CIA operative. I was just 17 years old. I was just interpreting for them because my English was good. I knew the slang and all of that. They said, no, no, you are a CIA operative. They put me behind bars. He said, they wouldn't let me read anything in English. Everything in French and Vietnamese, French and Vietnamese, Marx and Engels, Marx and Engels. They were indoctrinating me to the core with Marxism, communism, Marx and Engels, French and Vietnamese, no English whatsoever. He said, you know, this started to get to me. This started to really penetrate and months and months went by. No English. French Vietnamese, Marxist theory, Engels picturing how a man by in capitalism is put into a caged bird having to batter the wings to break free. You must be battering away till you break free from this capitalistic democratic stronghold and so on. He said, finally I came to the realization they were beating up on me emotionally and one day I said, I'm done. I'm done. I don't believe all I used to believe anymore. I've, they've broken me, I'm finished. And he said, I decided tomorrow I will not pray again. Brother Rafi, your sermons came to mind and I kept thinking and thinking. Were they all true? Were those messages from God's word true? And I decided I wouldn't pray anymore. He said, I woke up next morning at the appointed time, the commanding officer came to me and said, Hien, you're going to clean the latrines today. He said, Brother Rafi, the latrines there were awful. He said, you had to put something over your mouth and your nose and not to breathe it. It was filthy in that prison. And I started sloshing around cleaning this. And I came to a tin can with paper that had excrement in it. And I was to dump it. As I was dumping it, I noticed one of them looked like it was in English. I quickly turned around, took it out, hosed it off, put it into my hip pocket. I go back to my room. Late at night, I wait till everybody's asleep. I'm under my mosquito net. I pull out that piece of paper in English and on the top right hand corner, it says Romans chapter eight. And he starts reading. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. For what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall things present? Thing? He said, my brother, I just burst out crying. I was afraid I would waken everybody. I cried so hard. I put that paper against my face. And I said, God, you did not let me go 24 hours without letting me know you were here. He said, I woke up the next morning and asked the commanding officer, do you mind if I clean the latrines again today? <laughs> he said, do you know what I found out? Somebody had given him a Bible. He was tearing out pages from the Bible, using it as toilet paper. I was washing it and having my devotions every night. Finally, they released me. And I got out and I decided I was going to build a boat. And one of the high officers, one of the vice president's relatives was going to help me. And we were all going to escape about 52 or 53 of us. So I started to build the boat. We are getting to within days where we were going to set sail. When four Viet Cong came and knocked on my door. And they looked at me and they said, are you trying to escape from here? He said, no. I said, are you telling us the truth? He said, yes. And they left. He said, I got on my knees. I said, God, forgive me for lying. And I prayed a prayer that I hoped would never be answered. I said, if you really want me to tell them the truth, let them come back again. <laughs> Hours before we were to depart, depart, they came armed to the teeth, got a hold of him by the collar, rammed him against a wall. You're lying. You're trying to escape, aren't you? He said, yes, with 52 others. Are you going to put me behind jail, in jail again? They said, no, we want to go with you. The four of the Viet Cong came on board. He said, Brother Rafi, we were on the high seas and we were capsized in a storm. These four had mariner skills, took us to safety, brought us to Thailand. I was given the privilege of becoming a refugee coming to the United States. I'm now studying at Berkeley, doing my degree in business management. And I said, I have to call you and say hello. 
he flew to our home because he was engaged to a beautiful Vietnamese girl and he said, I want you to come and officiate at my wedding. And my three young kids sitting around the table, they knew the story of Hien. And they just kept staring at him and staring at him. And he leaned forward and here's what he said to them. He said, I want to tell you kids something. You are going to try again and again and again to run your own life. He said, don't be foolish. Totally surrender to the will of God. Your intimacy with him is the most important thing you will ever gain. I look at his life and I say to myself, every step was ordered. I look at my life with all of its fragility and I say, Lord, only you could have held the threads because I never even knew such threads existed. I look at you at this audience tonight and I see you the same way as I see myself, a man or a woman set at a certain time in history for a certain cause and for a certain need. South Africa needs you. South Africa needs the church. Will you be one of those who will say, Lord, let me be a man or a woman who will change my country for the glory of God. Don't get intimidated by the forces that will want to stop you. Anytime you say, let us rise and build, there will be those who will say, let us rise up and destroy. You will win because you're honoring God. And he is the ultimate winner. May God richly bless you. May you become a great nation for his glory. And I look forward to the day our paths will cross again. It's been a wonderful enrichment for me and my colleagues to be here. Thank you for your hospitality, your attention, your courtesy, your kindness. May I pray with you.